think I've got the syllabus teed up here. And yeah, just as a reminder of what of what we're doing for the rest of our time together is today I'm just going to introduce you to multivariate analysis, kind of this world, which I think some of you have dipped your toes in a bit. Um, but but yeah, it's, it's kind of wrap your heads around that. And that I, I think I mentioned this at the beginning of the course that a couple of times, um, oftentimes people start this part thinking, okay, this guy can kind of relax now because this is interesting, but it's not really pertinent to my work. Um, but but more than one person has kind of found something they can use in the stuff that they do, just in what we talk about. So. So yeah, it'd be great if that happened, but even if it doesn't, um, I think in pretty much every area I can think of, of at least bio research, um, multivariate is used in one context or another. So it'll be handy for you to have some understanding of it, just to understand papers that you wanna wrap your head around that are relevant to your research. So we'll, we'll do that uh, today. And as I said, Rather than doing the classification ordination piece in the hands-on section, I'm just going to use the hands-on today as kind of a GitLab two done. You know, any issues with that? So if you're not having issues with Lab two, um, feel free to check out. Uh, and anyway, we'll we'll solve everybody's problems with Lab two in the in that second hour. It might be a little less than an hour, depending on how long it takes me to do. Uh, a couple of modules of multivariate and then uh yeah so we continue next week and that that's when i will um i will get us into using or doing multivariate analysis in r and stuff like that in the hands-on section and then the third week of multivariate uh 13th of march there's a bunch of techniques that are they're becoming more popular recently. Uh, you may, I mean, the names may even ring a bell for you and the papers that you read in your area. So Permanova, K-means classification. I don't know why I've got that in there because we actually do that in the lab. But anyway, and then random forests is kind of a neat area of multivariate that we'll take a look at anyway. But None of the techniques we'll talk about that third week actually play into the lab that you do. The the lab you're going to get experience doing multivariate, you know, more standard multivariate analyses. Uh, that's that's lab three, which I've now made. Uh, I should learn, you know, because every year I have these due dates, and every year the, don't don't uh, be hard on yourself because I keep pushing the due dates every year. I kind of bend them a little bit because uh, it always takes folks longer to do stuff than I think it is. And that's not a critique of you. It's more me um, just forgetting the reality of kind of getting into and getting this stuff done uh, the first time around. So anyway, the multivariate lab three is, I think I've now got to do on the 22nd of March. So that way, it sort of comes after we've done talking about it and, and uh, working with the R scripts and stuff like that. The last thing we'll do, and it's just uh, just one day, which is, <laughs> I mean, it's ironic because this, this thing called statistical rethinking kind of totally changed my whole view of stats. So I just allocated, you know, 40 minutes or so of your time and a, a little, tiny bit of an assignment number four again this is really just getting you familiar with uh, Bayesian models and just that way of thinking uh, so yeah and then uh, because we have uh, I think if we count the two senior undergrads that are in the course I think we've got no more than eight people um, so we're going to do, we'll just do all the presentations in one day on the 3rd of April. Um, 
those, those will be um, live action, if I can put it that way. What I mean by that is uh, you'll present on Zoom. Obviously, Emily, you don't have to come down to Oshawa for that. Um, actually, nobody actually has to be in the room other than Flavia and I, of course, who are always here for the presentations. But live on Zoom, um, and then I'll be recording them because it's an important part of the presentation evaluation, as I'll look at right now is your evaluation of them. Okay, I'll, I'll give you the detailed uh, mark breakdown later, but suffice to say that each of you, the, half the mark on the presentation, there's just a presentation. It's not, you know, there's no paper that goes with it or anything like that. 15 minutes, it's worth like 20% of your mark in the course, no pressure. I mean, there's no pressure compared to that. Imagine when you defend your master's thesis, everything's on the table for your PhD, you know, that two hours, that's pressure, believe me. Don't get me started with stories about my, especially my master's defense, it was a horror show. Um, but anyway, uh, so yeah, that 15 present minute presentation, and I'll give you some guidelines on that. Um, a little bit more detailed in this, I'll, I'll uh, pull up an example from uh, a year or two ago, because uh, some people, and this this may happen, um, you know, if there's something important or dramatic that such that you can't be here, even on Zoom on the 3rd of April, um, we can organize like making a recording, which of course we all became good at during uh, during the pandemic, and uh, and you can do that, and then we we can all we'll all be able to evaluate it. But half of your mark in the presentation will be from me, and half will be the mean of the rest of the class. I get a little more weight since you know I'm the I'm the big cheese. Okay, so the the reason I wanted to mention it now is because um, you've got to find as this thing says. So you choose a published paper that I have to approve, and, and it's not a big deal. In fact, it's almost a smaller deal than when you chose your data set, uh, because, you know, like Flavia might send me a PDF of, of, I don't know, one of Andrea's papers, and say, is this okay? And I'd, I'd say, yeah, go for it. Or, or better yet, one of my papers. <laughs> it's funny, my daughter, who I mentioned a lot, she's just started a master's at Queens in neuroscience. And she's having to do a presentation, which is kind of like a critical review of a published paper. And it so happens that the author of the paper will be in the audience. I think she's doing it this afternoon. And and like neuroscience, this, the, the Queen's Translational Medicine Program, it's called, um, it's so much more hierarchical, uh, you know, like the, the esteem of the profs and i'm not asking for more esteem but i'm just saying it's a different different kind of world that i'm used to because she she was terrified of saying something negative about the paper in the presence of this person who wrote it and stuff and i just like in our class to me that's lots of fun and there have been people that have occasionally done mine or their supervisors. Anyway, if it's a paper in your field, some related to research that that you're doing or interested in, that's that's the best thing to go for, I think. And then what you do, it's not. I mean, you need to say enough about the paper so that we know kind of what it was about. But like Flavia is not trying to teach us about um, freshwater algae or. or you know, macrophytes and lakes and all that. She, you know, you use maybe a slide or two to establish what the study was about. But our main focus, given the nature of the course, is the design of the study. It's got to be a study that involves some aspect of quantitative data. And uh, so the design, the analysis, and the interpretation of the quantitative aspect of the study. 
and, and you kind of, you know, you're looking at that. And again, it's not just so you can trash the paper, but, you know, most papers, including mine, um, they, they could use some more constructive criticism. I think you all know about the process of reviewing papers that published papers go through. Um, uh, but, um, you know, what we really want to look at based on what we've talked about is, you know, does, did the research question link to the design that they have? Oftentimes, and, you know, present company included, there's sometimes a disconnect between what I go out and measure and what I thought I was working on, believe it or not. Uh, even monkey fall from tree, I guess, but, or whatever, but you're looking for that and, and just comment on, you know, this is a great connection of what they were after and what they measured and their design. And they might have looked also at this, you know, you're making suggestions, comments, both positive and negative. And really one of the one of the most important things is, you know, everybody makes an interpretation when you write a paper or a thesis of the data they've collected and the analysis they've done. Does that interpretation, do you do you agree with? how they've interpreted the results of their analysis. Um, so, so looking at that, so again, I think you'll see when I post an example video uh, what this is about, but if you're at all uh, unsure about it, then obviously just, just uh, send me a message and we'll have a chat about it. But uh, anyway, the key thing right now, since believe it or not, uh, Friday is March 1st, um, is find a paper you want to work on and send it to me. And, and um, all in almost all cases, I'll give you the thumbs up. One question that does come up a lot of the time is, um, do I have to kind of do look at everything that this person did? And, and the answer is no. You could pick out just aspects of it. Um, you don't have to cover the whole paper if it's if it's kind of a big convoluted thing uh, and um it doesn't have to it's not better if it includes more stuff different techniques than that we actually used uh you know i i've had i mean the famous one uh, a couple of years ago was from a biochemist and i'm losing his name now i was Ronnie, Ronnie Gentus, and uh, I think he's still still a grad student now. Anyway, he he chemist, you know, they don't know stats from a hole in the ground. <laughs> I think Ronnie wondered why it was in the course sometimes, but he needed the credit. But anyway, he he did actually did a great job because uh, he showed us how people in his discipline look at data and make judgments from, it. and in that case, it was like tables and and figures and stuff like that and he he suggested a couple of things which was really cool as well so so yeah it doesn't you know it's not like bonus marks if you find something that uses something from every lab assignment we've had it's more to do with you being able to get out a paper in your field and and really kind of understand what they've done and and again not just necessarily trash it but you, you're able to see what they've done what might have been a neat extension of it and, and things like that so so I look forward to seeing uh, which papers you're gonna uh, you're gonna look at anybody have any queries about that or are we good looks like we're good okay so multivariate analysis and you know, I, I I can't do multivariate without, of course, I always have a story. But um, I I first did multivariate analysis or looked at it when I was I was working on my master's with a guy named Jerry Mackey at Guelph. He was a, a freshwater mollusk guy. He really loved fingernail clams, and I I may stop me if I've told the story, but. So Jerry, world famous in uh, you know, knowing how to 
identify. And I don't know if you've seen them, Flavia, the, the little, not the big muscles that are, yeah, little, little, and there, there's basically two genera. Um, there's the, what are called pea clams that are really small, like, like your little finger is smaller, a couple of millimeters long. And then there's the uh, fingernail clams, spherium, musculium, those are the only two genera that I worked on. But anyway, they're, they're super hard to identify. You identify them by the, the sort of shininess of the shell and sometimes the teeth. And, the, you know, they don't have teeth in the sense you're thinking, but the teeth that kind of enable the, the two shells to kind of come together and, and, and stay together. Anyway, Jerry was a world expert. He he got people sending him stuff. Probably like Andrew had probably just sent algal samples from everywhere to take a look at. And Jerry Jerry would get samples. So his lab, we were up in his lab. He had like four or five grad students in the lab upstairs from his office. But then he had a little scope and everything set up in his office and his reference collection. So we would uh, regularly, you know, I was working on uh, pea clams, the little clams, and uh, we would regularly take a couple down for Jerry to identify. And, uh, you know, he would come up with something and then and then uh, one or the other, one person would take take one down, the other person would take the same one down to, to get a different answer sometimes. So we teach Jerry about that. He was a wonderful guy, great guy. Anyhow, okay, so, that's when I, I was working in, and what I did had nothing to do with multivariate analysis, but I got fascinated with it. I have no idea why. And the way I've always understood something, and it's kind of why in this course, I guess you're the, you get the, uh, you get the consequences of that, that I've never really understood stats until I've used it on something that, you know, like like the clams I was working on, and uh, and I've also I also have to get closer to the data. You know, like I've never really liked using stuff like I don't know if you use like SPSS or one of those menu based stats programs um, when you did undergrad stats. So I programmed um, multivariate analysis of all different kind, like all the kinds that you're going to use in Lab Three. Uh, using this uh, programming language called APL back then, which was really good with matrices and stuff like that. And I really felt like I understood how they worked. And, and there's actually, come to think of it, there's a paper I published based on working on multivariate analysis back then in the early 80s um, that that used this, the, the kind of the code that I did then for it. But um, yeah, I've always, and that's why, that's kind of why I like R. I know you're not really a totally at ground level when you're when you're working on an R script, but it's a lot closer than uh, menu driven stuff. And I feel like I understand the technique a lot more when I, when I do that. So let me introduce you for those who, and while, while I bring up the slides, I'm just gonna ask in the chat room if people can kind of just indicate, and, I, and don't worry, I'm not gonna test you or anything, but if you've had, some experience in at least, if not executing multivariate analysis with a data set, having to digest papers that have multivariate analysis in. If you just type that in, I'd appreciate it. And then I'll, uh, I'll find my slides here. There's an awkward silence in the chat room. Maybe <laughs> that's that's a good one. <laughs> I don't. I'm not really sure. <laughs> no, and, and and don't worry. I'm laughing with you, not at you. <laughs> this is probably what I would have said back. In the day. So it, as you'll see, I think um, the uh, oh, this is, I need the module before this. And what I was saying at the beginning is it, it sort of comes up or the opportunity comes up um, more often than you might think. Yeah.
Yeah, and that's what I was getting at right now, where not so much, you know, have you done it and, and all that kind of thing, but uh, you know, one of the one of my goals with this course is, and I've done it too, where you read a paper, they kind of do something, and you kind of gotta believe what they're saying, you know, especially if it's an analysis, and you know, I'm not sure what the hell they're doing, but I kind of have to take it on faith. And and it's not that I don't trust the researcher, it's just I like to kind of know where they got what they're saying from. Um, yeah, so that's what I meant by uh, exposure to it. Oh, meanwhile, uh, my convoluted file system here. There we go. The search for structure. And so, yeah, I, I think there's lots of situations, certainly, where I think this goes for all of us, where um, you re you're measuring more than one quantitative variable on each of the objects that you're looking at. And I guess the particular case, you know, after we get by this kind of initial level of uh, multivariate, the particular case I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, how we've been working with this response, quantitative response variable and quantitative or categorical predictors. Well, it's sort of the, the most general form of multivariate analysis is when you got more than one quantitative response variable. But the, the most general sort of circumstance is um, when we've got, we've just measured more than one quantitative variable on each of our observational units. You know, each of those rows that you have in your data sets, there's more than one quantitative variable. You know, some of them you might have labeled as, as uh, predictor variables and some as response variables, but you got more than one of them. So one of the first things we do with multivariate analysis is search for what's called structure. And the reason that I have, I'm pretty sure, I hope that's a painted turtle there. The reason that I have a painted turtle there is because the example I'm going to use, and you get this data set is in the downloadable folder on, on lab three stuff that we have. Um, is a very famous data set from uh, Pierre Jolicoeur and, and uh, I think it's Richard Moseman um, on a painted turtle data set. And I think there's 48, 48 painted turtle shells, uh, 24 males, 24 females. So we're going to look a lot at that data set as you sort of come to understand multivariate analysis, at least initially. So... As I was just saying, the nature of multivariate data is pretty simple. There's more than one response or predictor variable measured on each object. So the, the key thing about that, and, and actually you've done multivariate analysis already because multiple regression is a, is a type of multivariate analysis where obviously you've got more than one uh, predictor uh, measured on each object and, and just one response variable. But the key thing about it is whether we're talking about the response variables or the predictor variables, you're interested in more than just the variation of the variables, but also their co-variation. And we'll see kind of what that means in, in just a minute. So this initial search for structure, like I was saying, is not just, it's not this kind of response as a function of predictors context. It, it's more like correlation coefficients you know when you just do a scatter plot if we if we just had two uh shell measurements on each of those painted turtles did a scatter plot we could we could uh calculate the little r or the correlation of those two variables multivariate analysis and searching for structure is kind of like that only you've got three or 30 or 300 quantitative variables and so this the re and there's a research question with that kind of a data set. And it's, it tends to be along the lines of, do the data have structure? And if so, what is the structure? And 
what do we mean by structure? Well, this will probably give you a good hint as to that. This is, uh, I forget what, I think this might be from Systat, one of those packages I was saying I don't really like. Um, but it's a SPLOM, you know, I think everybody, I'm trying to remember, I believe I had a scatterplot matrix script. I don't know if you used it in lab one, but this, this is where you can do a matrix of scatter plots as you're seeing here and you get every possible combination. Like if you look down this column of plots, you've got height on the X axis. And in this case, you got length on the Y axis. So these are the painted turtle shells, the 48 painted turtles. And this is this here is a plot of length against height. And here, this is length on the x-axis and width on the y-axis. So but sort of a way of looking at least two variables at a time at the relationship between, between those two variables. Now, if we're looking at this, for, we'll talk about techniques that are used to identify structure, but um what would the data what would these scatter plots look like if there was no structure in the data because that's that's as i said our, our initial question is often is there any structure in the data and let me give you a hint about that a, a test that we often use to see if there's structure, a statistical test that we often use to see if there's structure in the data set is called the Bartlett's test of sphericity. And so what would the data, what would these scatter plots look like if there was no structure in the data? Anybody want to guess? Yeah, Flavia. Yeah, exactly. So and it, let's just put aside sex for a set, but, and, and yeah, Flavia nailed it where she said, oh, you know, and, and Emily's also mentioned it, that it's just going to be like a gunshot, right? And, and that's why it's Bartlett's test of sphericity, because if we had three, if we did a three-dimensional plot, it's just going to be like a sphere of point, not an exact sphere, but a sphere of points in a two-dimensional plot. It's like a circle, right? There's no relationship discernible relationship between the pairs of variables so what we're looking at is something other than that and we certainly see it here i mean we got we've got this accident you know it's pretty easy to know the the um major the nature of structure here where we've got um an axis or a gradient from little shells to big shells right that strong positive relationship between every pair of those height versus length, height versus width, length versus width. There's that, the main structural component there is just the size variation among those turtle shells. And as Flavia was saying, if, if we also look at sex, you can kind of tell, and we'll look at this more carefully uh, with other analyses, that Females tend to be bigger than males. If you look at those two plotting characters, the little circles tend to be higher on the scatter plots than the little triangles. So there's there seems to be some structure there. So how do we how do we go after that in multivariate analysis? Because you know most situations that we use multivariate analysis in are more complicated than just having three shell measurements, right? Um, if I'm looking at water samples and uh, components of those water samples, I might have 20 different ions that I've measured in the water. Or if I'm looking at soil samples or population numbers of a whole bunch of, of invertebrate species or whatever. So we need techniques that'll sort of figure out whether or not their structure and what the structure is um, when we have those more complicated data sets. 
So to do that, uh, this it takes me back to my childhood to see what you're looking at right now. This is an example of a distance matrix. And I always, I ask this question every year and it's fewer and fewer people. Um, I think last year it was none. So back in the day when, you know, when I used to be driving the family somewhere, you know, summer holiday or whatever, kids screaming in the back seat or throwing up or both. Um, my partner, a trusted partner, <laughs> would have a paper map out. So here's here's my question. Anybody here ever used a paper map? Yeah, well, it doesn't count if your parents use it. Has anyone, and I'm not talking about, you know, paper map and field work or that kind of thing. I mean, that's probably becoming rare as well. All the time as a kid, yeah, yeah, okay. So again, you, you might remember, you might remember your parents um, looking at a paper map. I remember province of Ontario every year, they used to put out this big official map of Ontario. And in the corner of it would be something like you're looking at right now. So what that's telling you is what's the distance between, I guess, Here's Niagara Falls to Collingwood is 256 kilometers. Now, but, so that's expressing with one number. And if you think about it, especially if you think about the fact that this is traveling on roads, that's a fairly complicated, there's a fairly complicated calculation behind each of the numbers in that distance matrix, right? It, because it's not just, you know, is it Archimedes? I always forget who's the guy who had the 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 distance or the length of, of the hypotenuse of a of a right angle triangle. No, it wasn't Archimedes. It was um, Pythagoras. Pythagorean theorem. Yes, thank you, Rainer. <laughs> Good to have fact checking. <laughs> what was I fact checking the other night? Anyway, um, so as Pythagoras said you know and you, actually it was euclid because it's euclidean distance is one of the distance measures we use when we're doing multivariate multivariate analysis and that's just and of course i should have a demonstration here ready for you I'll, we'll look at it in a graph in a sec but this is i guess what i was trying to say is this is more information than that in this distance matrix because this is like, okay, you take Highway 2, and then you turn right and Highway 55, and then you go down County Road 12. So there's all that, rather than just saying, okay, here's the Latin long of London, here's Collingwood, what's the distance between them as the uh, as the crow flies? So lots of information, and that that's true in a funny kind of way when we look at distance matrix, because the distance matrix is everything in multivariate analysis. It's everything, because it's collapsing information often about like hundreds of variables into one number, just like in a very much a different way here, there's lots of information about getting from one of these places to the other that's collapsed into one number, which is how far apart they are. And I mean, unlike our friend, uh, Mr. Google, you know, this is not incorporating what's the speed limit and all those little chunks, all that, I mean, you know, don't worry, I don't use paper map either. And I use Google Maps. I talk about this in my GIS course. I use Google Maps even when I'm like when I was driving to campus today. I know the way quite well, but of course, the great world of Google Map and other other crowdsourced maps like that. So I'm getting lots of information about what's happening along the route. But the bottom line here is we've got multivariate information. In this case, it's all about road segments and, and so on. It's being collapsed into one number, which is saying how different is Fort Erie from Collingwood, Hamilton from Grand Bend, all those different combinations. And we're gonna do exactly the same thing when we're talking about turtle shells or, or water sample analyses or whatever. So the distance measures 
they summarize in one number how different two objects are across all the variables that you measure. And the appropriate distance measure, you know, like that, that one number that combines all the information from chemical concentrations or population numbers or shell measurements. There's a, you know, there's people who built their careers developing different distance me measures, believe it or not. So the appropriate one for a given multivariate analysis depends on the nature of the variables. And you have to be aware or beware of what are, what's known as redundancy and and what are known as incommensurate variables. So redundancy is like, um, if I'm gonna be measuring humans and I say, okay, I'm gonna measure my height and I'm also gonna, me I'm gonna measure everybody's height and I'm also gonna measure everybody's distance from the bottom of their feet to their waist and the distance from the waist to the neck and the neck to the top of their head. So. If you've got a bunch of measurements, and, and a few of us talked about that when you were putting together your data sets, that in multivariate analysis and all kinds of analyses, you don't want what are known as redundant measures. You know, you know what this one is based on knowing what these two other two are, that kind of thing. Um, the incommensurate variable one is you have to do certain things if you've got variables measured in different units. If I measured um, the, the width of the shell in millimeters and the height of the shell in centimeters, I can't just put those two together. Then the, the length of the shell in millimeters is getting a lot more weight in whatever the distance measure comes out to be than the height of the shell measured in centimeters. So I've got to be wary of variables that are measured in different units. But there's there's ways around that. Okay, so what is the what 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 is the simplest way of getting a handle on whether or not the structure in a data set look like? And this is this is a technique used to be quite common, oh, I would say up till the 80s, maybe 90s. And it's you, you don't see it. I'm I'm not sure if any of you have seen this or will see this when you look at papers in your area, but hierarchical classification. The reason I still tell you about it and that you, you'll you actually do it in the lab is because I think it's a great way to kind of see multivariate analysis as determined from a distance matrix actually play out. Um, so what's happening here? Well, I've just shown you the, the top corner of the distance matrix of the turtles. So this distance matrix, remember it's one number that describes the difference between every pair of individuals in your data set. And so it's combined the differences, in this case, in shell height, length, and height, length, and width of the turtle. So three quantitative measurements have been blended together. And I think in this case, I used Euclidean distance. So I just said, okay, the difference in height, you know, which I can determine. So it's a, <laughs> sorry, it's the difference in height squared plus the difference in length squared plus the difference in width squared the square root of all that is that Euclidean different distance in three dimensions between those two turtles, right? That's all I've done here to create, or that's all R has done for me to, to create this distance matrix. So we know just by looking at the top of that, well, turtles one and two are a heck of a lot different in their measurements than turtles one and three. See, turtles one and two have a distance of almost four, and turtles one and three have a distance of only 0.79. So again, it's just blending together the difference in each of those individual quantitative variables. So the way the classification works, and we'll see what's called a dendrogram, it looks like a tree in the next slide. The way the classification works is that you have this distance matrix and you go through and you find the two most similar turtles, the two most similar objects. So they've got the smallest distance between them. 
and you combine them into a little group of two. And then you go back and figure out what the distance is between that pair and every other individual. And then once again, you look for the smallest distance and combine those. So you're, you're aggregating either pairs of individual turtles or an individual turtle with a group of turtles. And gradually you're creating this bigger and bigger group where you're putting together the, the most similar at each step, the most similar individual turtles or groups of turtles. That's hierarchical classification in a nutshell. So what does it look like when you're done? What you're looking at here. So these are the 48 turtles. And, and there's a little bit more information here that's in the data set that I haven't talked about. So you've got M and F. If you look sideways, tilt your head a bit, and you'll see the, the 48 turtles are all along the x-axis there. But this is not like a static graph, like y-axis and x-axis has to be there. Think of it more like um, when... When my kids were little in, in the crib, I had those, um, you know, the, the mobiles over top. So think of a, a string holding the mobile up the top here. So that the whole thing can, and I hope this doesn't freak you out too much, the whole thing can spin around, but that's what we're preserving is those similarities, the grouping together of turtles, the most similar turtles at each step as we move from the bottom here up to the top where they're all in one big group at the top. So on the, on the Y axis, you're seeing the distance between the individuals or the groups at the point they were linked together. So the whole thing becomes grouped, one big group at the top here at a, at a distance of over 2.5. But then down at the bottom, can anybody see that first, very first pairing of turtles was right there? I think that's the closest. Very small distance. It looks like these might have had exactly the same measurements of length, height, and width. These are two female turtles that were river inhabitants. I've just got habitat as part of the, just for the purposes of some analyses we're going to do later. So what you're seeing is at each step, there's a grouping, you know, the two most similar at that step are being paired together. And then that distance matrix gets recalculated and on it goes up. And what you look for when you're looking for structure, this, this is showing, this dendrogram is showing that there does seem to be some structure in the data. Now, how am I seeing that? Because of these big jumps in distance before groups get put together. So let, the easiest way to look at that is right over here with this little group on the very left here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six turtle shells. The first two in this group came together here at this level of distance. And then just one notch above that, this third turtle got added to the group. And then a a little bit above that in distance, this fourth turtle got added. And then there was a jump before this fifth turtle got added. So we've got a, quite a tight, similar group here. And then this one that's slightly, quite a bit different than the other four comes in. And then this total weirdo here on the end, she's not coming in until this distance up here. She's not joining the rest of the five of them. So that's that's what, where I'm seeing the structure is if there's no structure, you're just going to see turtles being added to until you've got this mass of the whole group at, at the at the up the topmost part of the dendrogram. If there is structure, you're seeing stuff like this where there's jumps, there's either individuals or groups being added and and that's evidence of structure. The reason that I've labeled the, the sex, and the habitat on the bottom is if I, I'm just qualitatively looking to see if that structure corresponds to either sex or, or habitat or both. 
And what I'm seeing, by the way, is, okay, if we look at this, see how there's a group here, I'm circling with uh, the yellow arrow, and those are almost all females. So there's one male there, but the rest of this group are all females, and all of this group are females. Um, most of this group are males. Most of this group are males. There's a few females in here. So yes, there does seem to be some correspondence between the grouping that we're seeing, the structure that we're seeing, and sex, um, and a little bit of correspondence with habitat, a lot of forest turtles in here. But that's the sort of qualitative analysis that you're going to do to see. And there's other ways, as you'll see when we work with the R scripts, that you can see whether or not there seems to be correspondence between the groupings we're getting with classification and think categorical variables like, in this case, sex and habitat. But what I really want you to see is what is the evidence of structure in the data? And the, the evidence of structure in the data is basically these big jumps that we're seeing in distance before individual turtles, as in this case, or groups of turtles, as in this case, come together. That's evidence of structure. And I make a judgment, and the judgment I've made is what, the reason I've got that, that red horizontal line there. That's just me drawing a line at that distance, indicating that I think there's one, two, three, three groups here, and then one strange one, this female on the end here. But it's entirely a, a qualitative judgment I've made by looking at the dendrogram and saying, yeah, I've got two, two uh, loose subgroups here that define this group on the right. I've got this middle group here that's quite distinct from the others. And then I've got this group here, which has this one weirdo and five quite similar individuals in it. So that's the nature of the structure and the data set that I'm seeing there. So as I said, the classification, as I've just shown you in that, that hierarchical classification is becoming less common. What, what's more common now, much more common, and which those of you who've had some exposure to multivariate analysis would, would be familiar with is um, ordination. Ordination just means, you know, I, I'm not really happy with putting things into to groups with that classification piece. I think things are more gradual. There's more gradients of individuals. So if I, I see groups, I want to see them on more of a continuous scale. And that's what ordination does for us. It's using exactly the same raw materials as the uh, classification. That's why I've got that, that distance matrix that you're seeing in the middle there, or at least part of the turtle distance matrix, is exactly the same one that we used for the classification. It, the difference is in how we use that to create what's called an ordination or a low dimensional representation of multi-dimensional data. So the, one of the most common ways now to do that is what's called non-metric multi-dimensional scaling. So I'm gonna show you how that works. And this is, this is um, uh, fairly, a fairly weird if you if you haven't been exposed to this this is this takes a while to get get your head around so that's why i'm going to take it pretty slowly um think of an xy plot here and we're not in any way the reason i haven't I haven't uh, labeled the x and y axes of this plot is i'm not really concerned about those i'm concerned about the distance between points and i've got Mark there, turtle one, turtle two, and turtle three. So the first step with non-metric multidimensional scaling, I'm just gonna throw the points on the graph randomly. So I've got an X, Y plot. I just threw the, the three points for the first three turtles on that graph. And um, 
what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm trying to, I'll go back to this for a sec. I'm trying to, to do the best job I can making a plot in two dimensions that is really reflecting the distance matrix of the turtles, which in our case is three dimensions, right? There's three turtle measurements or shell measurements, but it could be um, chemical concentrations where there's 25 different elements we've measured. It could be uh, communities where we've measured the abundance of 150 species. But the idea is I want this very simple plot just in two dimensions to do the best possible job of telling me the nature of that distance matrix. So I start randomly and then I calculate what's called stress. So here's, here's what stress is in case you don't know. Um, so ordination distance on the y-axis is just, if I go back to my random plot, what's the distance between turtle one and turtle two on this simple plot? And what's the different distance between turtle two and turtle three on this simple random two-dimensional plot? And what's the distance between turtle one and three? So I have that distance for from my ordination, I also have the real distance, right? From the real turtle shell measurements. And if I've done a good job of doing the plot in two dimensions, these points are gonna be right along the diagonal, right? The, the real distance will be well represented in the ordination. If they're not doing, if the ordination is not doing that good a job, these are gonna be quite different. And the, the deviation between where the point actually is and that line of equality is called stress. So you, you kind of add up the stress for all of your turtles, in our case, all your observations, and you improve the fit. There's algorithms, of course, you're not doing this, R is doing this under the hood, but you're moving the points around to reduce stress. That's the idea. So you threw them on there randomly, you calculated what stress was, and then you use a clever algorithm to say, well, if we just move this one over here and that one over there a little bit, a titch, we're gonna reduce stress. And we did reduce stress, so we check it again. Yeah, it's a little bit smaller. And then we improve the fit some more, and we keep going around and around and around. So it's an iterative procedure that's lowering the stress as much as possible so that we end up with the best possible, simple two-dimensional picture of that distance matrix. And I'm just showing you there, that's, that's the way it looks when you run it in R and we'll do that next week. So what does that look like when you're done with the actual turtles? There it is. So if you've ever seen uh, an ordination in papers that you've had to read or whatever, you'll you'll find sometimes people are flummoxed because you know it's weird. I've I've never published an ordination where I actually include the axes, like axis labels and and uh, numbers on the axes before. Because as I was saying, the actual numbers on those scales don't matter to us, which sounds totally weird, but it's true. What really matters to us is turtles that are close together points that are close together are very similar with respect to those quantitative variables that went into the distance matrix and turtles that are far apart are super different so here we've got and take a guess who this this female over here far end of the ordination female from the forest is really different from this male in the river. How, how are they really different? They're really different with their three shell measurements. That's the only thing we know about them, their three shell measurements. So, and this male from the river and this male from the forest are almost the same in terms of their shell measurements. So what we're seeing here, and, and people in general, and certainly I find this much more satisfying than looking at the dendrogram to get an idea of uh, structure in the data. But it is interesting, and you'll see this when you, you'll do both of these. 
this female in the forest is that's her right over there so so we're seeing the same structure but the the added benefit we're getting here is that we see how the the female remember the females were the main part of that that group on, on the left side of the dendrogram they're a much looser group much more variable group than the males which are this tighter group over here so there's more tends to be more information in the ordination what tends to be the trickiest thing about it I used it in the paper I just published about um uh evidence of climate change from uh, BC bioassessment data is it's a it's a diff a tricky communication piece <laughs> put it that way so the reviewers of the manuscript they're saying oh well the ordination you know it's like a black box smoke and mirrors kind of analysis so it and I had a grad student once who used it extensively and she she had a lot of trouble from uh, one of her thesis examiners because I'm not blaming him it's always saying him I'm not blaming him but it it does become a communication piece critical if you use it to be able to explain it um oftentimes with multivariate analysis and we'll see this if anybody has uh has it playing a role in the paper they discuss people tend to blow by a lot of uh, complex analysis uh, without without adequately explaining it but the bottom line with ordination again it's it's not it's not complicated <laughs> um that observations that are close together have very similar values for those variables that went into making that distance matrix observations that are far apart have very different values and that the bonus of that is we're seeing the structure that's there in the data set we're seeing groups of turtles at least defined by their shell measurements and variability among turtles as defined by their shell measurements in that ordination 